Well, thank you very much for that kind invitation. I, I must say I was um, somewhat intrigued that the speakers of the first session were allowed to choose their topic. Sean actually <laughs> wrote to me and said, I'd like you to speak about the surgeon's dilemma. And of course, I thought he meant Hatton. Um, <laughs> but then uh, a subsequent uh, email indicated that it was about thrombosis and antithrombotic therapy. And I will, I will touch on that. Otherwise known as bleeding and clotting for those of you who are not medically orientated. And this, uh, in my career, we have seen all sorts of issues um, with respect to uh, bleeding and clotting, DVT prophylaxis, intraoperative heparin, an array of antiplatelet therapies, and anticoagulation, warfarin, and now even newer anticoagulants. And really, there have been people very like Hatton all over the world working diligently to make the life of a surgeon even more difficult than it already was. <laughs> I have a couple of declarations to make. The first of these is that I am a vascular surgeon and therefore bleeding and clotting is really a daily event, uh, let alone a challenge. And the second declaration is that for 20 years every patient that I have been, I've operated on has been scrutinised by Professor Salem seven days a week. In fact, I spend a lot more time with Professor Salem than I do with some other people who are slightly dearer to me. <laughs> uh, even this morning, we spent morning tea discussing some patients that he actually managed to get out of bed at 6am to see for me. Um, the fact that he has scrutinised and worked with me for 20 years, looking at every patient, really means that at least one of us is incredibly tolerant. <laughs> this is a photo of the great man. It is clearly a posed photograph. <laughs> he's neatly dressed, he's had a haircut. You can tell that this is one of a thousand shots that was taken and this was the best one. <laughs> This shot, on the other hand, is <laughs> slightly more typical. You'll note on the left hand that this is a glass of rather expensive French champagne. He's not actually sipping it, you'll notice. <laughs> and on the other hand is a croquet mallet. Well, we all know something of Hatton's story. He began in Egypt and Iraq and then to England, of course, then to Australia. And True to form, he did a lot of research about where it was he was going to live in Melbourne. And his research led to him to conclude that sunshine sounded like a happy place. <laughs> but unfortunately he ended up at Box Hill, which in fact I think really has been the scene of many of his greatest achievements. And as any diligent speaker at a fest strip will do, he'll do some research on the candidate, on the person he's speaking about. And I would turn to the history of Box Hill Hospital. And there, there is this quote, his encyclopedic knowledge and inspirational nature is combined with bewildering energy and an unusual personal charm. Although sickening, it is actually, <laughs> it is actually true. <laughs> Which is, if you think about it, even more sickening. <laughs> Now, it does, of course, neglect that he does have a, a really disturbing tendency to religious fanaticism. And, of course, uh, I speak about Hawthorne, Hawthorne Football Club. But there is actually another fanatical obsession that he has had over the years that many of you who have been his students or residents will have been subjected to. And this is the could have been champions. Many of you will remember that they are a group of four people who ran a uh, 70774 radio program on a Saturday afternoon, and they invented a whole range of characters. But Hatton's personal favourite was Guru Bob. <laughs> Guru Bob. Hatton actually memorised many of Guru Bob's sayings and then would recite them back to some <laughs> unsuspecting person. Here is one of those sayings. Before you criticise someone, walk a mile in their shoes. That way, when you criticise them, you're a mile away and you've got their shoes. 
Or what about this one? It matters not whether the glass is half full or half empty, or whether it's two-thirds full or five-eighths empty. What matters is how much is in the bottle next to the glass. <laughs> Guru Bob also had a habit of quoting other famous people. Here is one such a quote from Sheikh Yabu. 42.5% of statistics are made up on the spot. <laughs> I actually do have a serious part of my talk today, and um, this actually concerns a patient. One patient. Patient by Mrs. E.C., 64, 2007. She was due to have an elective, open, AAA repair at Box Hill Hospital. Pretty well, but on warfarin because of a past history of atrial fibrillation. It was decided that she should have the warfarin ceased five days preoperatively and heparin, heparin bridging therapy begun. Hospital and the home began to visit her each day and delivered her daily dose of colexane. She was admitted and at the appointed day there was no ICU bed. So unfortunately the surgery had to be postponed and she was discharged and rebooked for surgery at two weeks. But no one thought to reinstitute the hospital in the home or to reinstitute the warfarin therapy. And ten days after the postponement, she was readmitted as an emergency. And she'd had a left middle cerebral artery embolic stroke, which left her with a severe hemiplegia and there was very, no, very little recovery. So the question was, how did this happen and how could it be avoided? Well, with respect to the first question, when we sat down to look at the whole concept of heparin bridging therapy, we could see that it was a system that was designed to fail. There were so many possible errors in the system. How could it be avoided? Well, enter Professor Salem. I spent most of the 1980s overseas, and when I came back in 1989, I found that on the 1st of January, uh, Box Hill had ceased to be a Melbourne University teaching hospital but it had become a Monash University teaching hospital and the first academic appointment was the Professor of Medicine uh, at Box Hill and that was Hatton. He was also, it's, it's kind of characteristic isn't it, he was the head of this and that and this and that and this and that but anyway he was also the head of the Division of Medicine, he was head of the Hematology Unit and he also managed to become a member of the hospital board. And in the 1990s in uh, Hatton had many achievements, but I think two of them that stand out for me, particularly are the Australian Centre of Blood Diseases and ECRU, establishing these organisations which will persist on. So Professor Salem began, uh, was confronted by the Surgical Research Group at Box Hill Hospital for some advice about what we could do as an alternative to managing patients on warfarin who required operation. Was there an alternative to heparin bridging therapy? And, Clearly the characteristics that we needed was that it had to be safe and simple, it had to be controllable, cost effective, and we had to be able to return the patient to a warfarinized state without difficulty. And that led us to look at prothrombinex, which is a uh, purified protein complex. Um, it has factors 2, 9 and 10 and a very small amount of factor 7. It is in fact a byproduct or a waste product after the collection of immunoglobulins and is available through blood bank. So we had a few questions about prothrombinex. Does it work? Does it lead to a rebound hypercoagulable state? That was a bit of dogma that was around at the time when we began this. And are there any other dangers with prothrombinex? So we did what all good people should do and that was turn to the literature first. It was remarkable how little literature there is about prothrombinex. There's the occasional case study, but that is really about all. And so that led us, having asked these questions, to design a fairly simple study conducted at two hospitals that Hatton works at, the top one being Box Hill and the second being the hospital opposite Epworth Eastern Hospital. And we decided to uh, take the next 50 patients who were on warfarin who are going to under have elective vascular surgery. And we decided to continue their warfarin right up to the time of their admission. And we had measured their INR immediately preoperatively, gave them prothrombinex, and then we measured their INR again. The operation was performed. And then if they were not nil orally, they were given their usual dose of warfarin again on the night of operation 
and they continued to have their INR measured on a daily basis until it returned to a therapeutic level. So 47 of the 50 patients were able to recommence their warfarin on the night of operation. There were three patients who had an open abdominal aneurysm repair who could not. And the operations really covered the whole gamut of vascular surgery. The last one, varicose vein surgery, is, is perhaps the most minor surgery, but in fact it's the one that's associated with the most potential bleeding. So 48 of the patients had their initial INR um, greater than two, that is to be therapeutic. And 50 patients following the administration of prothrombinex had an INR of 1.3 or less. In fact, the vast majority had an INR of one. No patient experienced a hemorrhagic or thrombotic complication and no adverse event was attributable to the prothrombinex in the study. And 47 of the 47 patients able to take the war from the night of operation returned to their ther therapeutic INR by day three. And in fact, this graph just shows, I suppose, diagrammatically exactly what happened. The uh, preoperative uh, INR was therapeutic. They were given the prothrombinex immediately prior to surgery and had their operation. And let's draw your attention to the gentle re-anticoagulation in an orderly fashion that took place in these patients. So we concluded that prothrombinex allowed immediate reversal of the warfarin anticoagulate state. And it avoided the need for early post-operative heparinization. Now, a previous observation of ours was that if you heparinize someone within 24 hours of an operation, or within 48 hours in fact, you are bound to get uh, hematomas in the wound. This was unavoidable. And this is a characteristic of heparin bridging therapy. The re coagulation is easy and very efficient without INR fluctuations that might prolong hospital stay. So the use of prothrombinex allowed us to completely change our clinical practice and the management of patients on warfarin who required operation. We've actually gone a little bit further now because armed with the knowledge that we can instantaneously reverse their warfarin status, we now perform most of the operations without stopping their warfarin at all. So it led to another question, of course. Prothrombinex does not have very much factor seven in it at all. So why on earth should it work? And that actually led to another study, but that's a story for another day. So the conclusion that ultimately I'd like to leave with you is that we had a patient event. We asked questions, we analysed what happened. We undertook some research, resulted in a publication, but most importantly, it changed the way that we practice completely. Adam is a man of many parts. He's an inspiring leader, an inspirational teacher, an enlightened researcher. He's won innumerable awards and accolades. But as I was preparing this presentation, I sat down and thought, what is it that is Hatton's greatest contribution? And we will each have our own opinion of that. But having observed him over 20 years very closely, I've come to the conclusion that he is an outstanding bedside clinician. It's been an honour and a privilege to be able to call Professor Salem a colleague, but it's been an absolute joy to call him a friend. Thank you.